Whoever got one to write it wrote it, and he wrote this so that we could have it today. End of story. Okay, but here he's talking to saved folk. He says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, talking about those that have gone on before, today, can stand over the banister. I'm, really, I don't know if you can stand over the banister of glory and look back and see what's on this side. I don't know. I know you could in Abraham's bosom, but I don't know about the third heaven. I know God can see it. No, Christ can see it. I don't know if they can. I'm kind of of the opinion that once you get there, you're so consumed with Him, you don't care no more. But, anyway, just things that we won't know until we get there. But we are compassed about with those, the witness of those that have gone before us, right? The end samples given to us in the Old Testament and the New Testament, right? The chosen that, not, they weren't chosen because, you know, there's anything special about them. They were chosen because they put their faith in God. And God chose that whoever was obedient to what he said, he'd bless them. Right? He'd use them. Wasn't anything special about them. But also, we're compassed with so great a cloud of witnesses here. Are we not written epistles known and read of all men? Everybody's got witnesses around us looking at what our life says about Christ. But how do we embrace that responsibility? He says, got a whole lot of people watching you. He said us, which meant also watching him. But he says, let us lay aside every weight and okay, keep that in mind I've heard this taught many a times that the weight that slows us down is sin well no there's, there's an and right there before the sin and after weight the weight that eat, you know, weighs us down doesn't say that the weight besets us it says that the weight we need to lay aside it slows us down weights don't keep you pinned in we'll get to that here in a second a weight you can still move with it but it's not as easy I used to hate to run bleachers in the hot summers playing football but you know the ones that I really hated is when they thought you were doing it too quick so they'd hand you a 45 pound weight and tell you to run the bleachers you could still do it it's just harder right you would tire yourself out quicker which takes us down to verse number 3 for consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. You can't faint if you're not working. But he says that weight, as you're working, it's going to wear you out quicker. You can faint in your mind. So lay it aside. That weight, if you can lay it aside, you were the one that picked it up. Because if God gives it to you, only God can take it away. But if I can lay it aside, then that means that I'm the one that put it upon myself. We could talk a whole lot about, weight. well, is it the weight of burdens? Well, he said, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. He said, take upon his yoke, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So if it's weighing us down and making the call that God put upon our life hard to do, the writer of Hebrews is saying, take account. There's going to be hard days if you're in the will of God. But if every day's hard, if there's never a valley that you eventually get out of, right, maybe we need to take inventory. Is the weight that I'm carrying that's so heavy, is it something that I put on me or is it something that God put on me? Yep, that's a whole different lesson. We don't have time to teach on that. But we had to make the distinction. He says the weight... But then he also talks about the sin. The weight will slow you down. But the sin, it says, and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Now, see, like I said, a weight, it'll hinder you, but it won't stop you. You can still move with a weight. But see, that word beset, that means that you're pinned in. To beset means you've completely surrounded. That you have immobilized. If you have a dog or a cat, and before you left to come to church today, you put it in a kennel or in a crate, you beset your pet so that your pet couldn't run around the house when you weren't there and tear everything up. That animal, if you've got a 
you know, decent quality one, it can't get out of the cage. Right? That's the whole point of the cage. If the animal could get out of the cage, you would have gone and gotten a refund the day after you bought it. Beset means that you keep it from moving. It's a military term referring back to when they would siege a city. That they would completely surround the city and beset it. The city was still free to do whatever it wanted to inside of the walls, but there wasn't no trade coming in, there wasn't no food coming in, wasn't no water coming in. They would beset it. Which means it's a done deal. Unless something changes, if you're beset, eventually you're going to be conquered. Unless there's an act of God or unless something changes about what is besetting you, once you're beset, you're dead. It's just a matter of time. Eventually you're going to run out of food. Eventually you'll run out of water in your house. Eventually, you know, like so many times, Israel would be overthrown. Israel would suffer harsh things. And if they were being besieged, I mean, there was a time in Israel, they got so far away from God, they were besieged, they were running out of food, they started boiling their children and eating them. That's beset. They couldn't get food if they wanted to. They couldn't have found water, no matter how hard they looked. That's what beset means. You're helpless and you're stuck. Okay, well, he says, let us lay aside every way and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us and in our end sample the example that we should strive to emulate the one that we should run like verses number 2 and number 3 Christ Jesus so as I was, I, I don't know when I started the Lord brought this verse back to my mind I've been pondering it so the writer of Hebrews says we got a race to run with patience. We've all heard that preached on. Okay, those things that'll weigh us down. Burdens are heavy, but are you taking extra burdens upon yourself? Are you weighing yourself down with excess weight? Then he gets into, but there is that one thing that it'll keep you from running altogether. He says it's the sin which does so easily beset us. And as I was thinking about that, keep it in mind, he's talking to safe folk. He's talking to people that are blood-bought, they're redeemed, right? They know about the forgiveness of their sins. He's saying there's a sin, and it says, doth so easily beset us. It doesn't just beset us, it's just so easy for it to. Right, well, start thinking about it. What about... What is that sin? Or what are those sins? Okay, well, let's be honest. If you're blood bought, sin, I mean, we just talking about it. He got up. That meant when he saved you, sin no longer had power over you. So it's not the inherent sin that is within you, it's not the sin in your flesh. Is you know wicked as the Bible teaches us that our own heart is so so wicked that we can't even know it, right? It's not the sin that's still a part of this flesh that easily besets us. Does the Revelation say that He made His kings to rule and reign over this flesh? That's not this. It's not the sin that's still a part of this flesh because you know it's just a mortal garment, right? I'm changing one of these days, whether I go through the clouds or whether I go through the grave. He's going to have a body like his. Be fantastic. This ain't going with me. In fact, the Holy Ghost separates my soul from my flesh. So I know, so long as there's nothing between me and God, right? That's what this sin that easily, that's what these weights are. They're things that come between us and God. But see, it's not the sin that I was born with that keeps me from running the race. Are we not more than conquerors through Jesus Christ? We can overcome the flesh. 
That's not what it's talking about. Right? Just because you've still got a sinful flesh attached to you, that's not what besets you as a Christian and keeps you from running. You can if you want to. That's what boils it. Do you want to run more than you don't want to run? That's dealing with the flesh. Right? So that, that's not what it's talking about. Is it talking about the sin of the world? Well, no. Because that sin out there, unless I choose to partake of it, can't touch me. Right? Unless I choose to take or partake in or commit sin, right? the sin in the world can't do anything to me. It's there. There's the curse of sin. It'll be there until Christ takes it away. Right? But the curse of sin, it may have an effect on me. Right? I mean, I'm going to die one of these days if the Lord don't come back. It's an effect of sin. You know, through one man, sin passed upon all men, and death by sin. That's just going to happen. But it doesn't matter how wicked the world gets, that doesn't directly impact me unless I want it to. Okay, they can be doing whatever they want to next door. If I want to live for Christ, I can still do it. Just because they're exceedingly wicked doesn't mean that I still can't have an exceeding relationship with the Lord. Right, well, let's go one step further. Is it sin that we commit unknowingly? No, go see Noah. Right, if you are ignorant of the fact that what you just did was sin, the Lord doesn't hold it again, but once you find out it's sin, you best not do it again. So it's not unknown sin. Now, that can't have an impact on us. Well, we start getting into you know, the qualifier for unknown sin, for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not. If you didn't know the difference between good and bad, right, we're without excuse. Not, well, I mean, we got the handbook right here. Right, we ought to strive to know the book as well as God does. Right, but practically, right, if I didn't know that not picking up that phone would offend somebody because I was in the middle of doing something else, is that it's it? Nope, I should feel sorry for it afterwards. I ought to know better next time. Maybe it was a learning moment from the Lord. Maybe God wanted me to help that person, but instead, I've turned them bitter against me. Well, is that it? Well, if I do it repeatedly. But if I didn't know, then no. But then, let's take it one step further. Is it the sin that we do commit? I mean, we all sin. Every single day. Right? Always, I mean, let's be honest, always will until the day we die. Is that what easily besets us? No, because I find that if we confess our sins, He's faithful just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Right? The fact that we still sit isn't even the thing that can so easily beset us. Because if our desire is to remain as close to God as we can, we will confess our sins and He's promised to forgive them. So even that, like I said, you got bottom air. I've been thinking about this a while. We're a couple of steps down the rabbit hole right now. So many different types of sin, but even the sins that we do commit, if we truly are repentant, those can't even beset us because they're forgiven. But then that brings in the question of, well, what is repent? Well, if you turn from it, then you won't do it again. Repent of it. Christ will take it away. It cannot beset you. You may still have to pay the price for it, but accountability is not the same as immobility. Accountability means I've got to take account. I've got to pay the price for my actions, but it doesn't beset me. I'm still able to go on and do what God wants me to do. So what's the sin that does so easily beset us? It's the sin you want to commit. All the sins that we just talked about can't do anything to you so long as you're right with God. But in order for you to be completely hemmed in, right, surrounded on all sides, kept from moving by sin, you've got to want to commit the sin and then you've got to want to stay there in the pen. That's the sin that does so easily beset us because we want to do it. 
all this devil can tempt me with all the things I don't want to do it won't affect me it wouldn't be called temptation then temptation is when it's something you want to do or the flesh wants to do that old man and the new man strive against each other but even the apostle Paul said that in the midst of that struggle there are days that he would do but then he didn't the things he wanted to do for God he wouldn't do and the things that the old man wanted to, do, wanted to do that his inward man didn't want to do, he'd end up doing them. But again, that key was, it won't beset you if you truly repent of it. If you've turned from it, it can't keep you surrounded. The one that keeps you surrounded is the one that you wanted to do, that you want to keep doing, and you, you have no intent to stop doing it. You say, well, that sounds pretty serious. Yeah. So it must be a big sin. Well, no big sin, no little sin. It can be the simplest thing that you know you shouldn't be doing it, but yet you want to do it, so you keep doing it. That can beset you in your spiritual life. I mean, there's always a pull to sin just because it starts off what we may classify as, well, that's not that serious. doesn't mean it's going to stay not that serious for long. If you can't move and you're trapped because you want to stay there, right? That pit is just going to keep getting a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. Think of it this way. The longer the prodigal son stayed in the hog pen, the further he sunk down into the muck and the mire. You ever walk through a little bit of mud and you feel like, oh, I'm pulling on my feet a little bit, but I can get out of it. You ever stood in mud for a second and you go to move and your feet don't? That's the difference. The longer you stay beset, the harder it is to start moving again. But the reason that sin so easily besets us, it's just so trivial. The devil don't even have to try. Why? Because you want to. And worse off, even if we knew we were wrong to start off with, or... Later, if we find out that we were wrong and we shouldn't have, we choose to stay where we're at. We're beset. And the tragedy of it all is, to beset something, you've got to put up defenses around it. Doesn't the Bible say that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God? There's no way the devil should be able to beset us, but yet we let him. That's the tragedy, though, that it so easily besets us because we chose to let it happen. We, let, we choose to let it continue. If we were to get right with God, nothing the devil could do. He knows that he can't take us off of the solid rock, but he knows that he can keep us from moving around on the rock. He knows he can keep us from developing our relationship. So easily besets us. Why? Because if you want to do it, if you've got that desire problem in your heart, today, if you want to do this, tomorrow you may want to do something else. Well, then what? Then you hemmed in on two fronts. Now you've got two fences set around you. And the more you choose to partake in, the worse it is for you to get. People that aren't right with God know that they're not right with God. Right? Well, if they don't, why wouldn't they come back to church? If they know that they need to get back to church, why don't they? It's one of them fences. Shame. Pride. Humiliation. They don't want to face others that they might have done wrong. Knowing that they're wrong. They would, I wouldn't do it again. I'm sorry for it. But they, they don't want to look that person in the eye. What is that? That's something that so easily besets us. Because let's be honest. If you really wanted to get right with God, it doesn't matter who's in the way. Daniel knew that if he prayed like he had three times a day for his entire life, they were going to throw him in the lion's den. What did he do? He prayed. Didn't face him at all. He knew what was good. He knew what was right. 
And he said, I'm going to do it. Doesn't matter who says that it's wrong, I'm going to do what God said. It would have been easy to say, well, I'm not going to pray. Well, one day not turn it, or one day not praying can turn into two and three and four and then eventually you get like Solomon who God gave great wisdom but yet in his old age he bowed down and worshipped false gods how'd that happen one day he chose to and then it continued and continued and continued it so easily besets us because first we want to stay there but then by the time we want to get out it's got its fangs in us the snares of the devil wouldn't be called snares if they didn't work The reason it's called a trap is because it traps you. But the best trap is the trap that the animal wants to walk into. So easily besets us. It's like be running a race and shooting yourself in the leg. Literally. That's what he's talking about. Here. You, beset means you can't move. He said, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. You can't do anything if you're beset. But that's why all those other sins, if you really wanted to live for Christ, any sin's not going to get between you and God. But your treasures are going to be where your heart is. If we, like verse number 2, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, if that truly is our focus, that we set our face like a flint toward God, looking for what He would desire, nothing will beset us because we won't allow it. We're vigilant because we know our adversary is the devil like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he made of our we know that he's out there so we're always on guard when the thought does creep into our head well we used to like doing we're not even talk, we haven't even got into iniquity right? we're just talking about sin what we know we shouldn't do but yet we still keep doing it iniquity a whole different story that's unequal dealing with God right that also can beset you but here we're just talking about not talking about iniquity things that we know we ought not do things that we've heard preached on but yet we still cling to them we sit there and we'll argue with ourselves for 15 minutes and really we're not arguing with ourselves we're probably arguing with the Holy Ghost on I, I know that I ought not do it I'll, afterwards I always feel miserable but yet, I'm still going to do it. Doesn't matter how long I talk to myself, still going to do it. Doesn't matter how long I debate it, I'm already one foot closer to it than I was when I started debating. Trying to convince ourselves that, well, I, I can stop doing this whenever I want to. Prove it. Stop doing it. Well, I know that I should be closer to God than I am. Then why? I mean, I get it. Right? My biggest problem is me. The biggest thing that keeps me from being what God wants me to be is the fact that I've got to get me to there. But it's easy for anybody to say, well, I know what your problem is. Really? Well, let me tell you what all of yours are. Right? The problem is, is that I know where I should be, but the problem how do I get there? Well, the truth is, is that I die, Christ liveth in me. He's the one that's going to get me there. I can't make myself into a new creature. But what I can control is what I do and what I don't do. Why do we do those things which so easily beset us? We know that they're going to hem us in. We're going to be miserable from, you know, Sunday to about Wednesday at 7.30 because we can't really enjoy the singing at the beginning of the service. And we've got to get to preaching to you know, knock the calluses off of us to get us to repent. But then we know that as soon as we get out that we're going to go do it again. That's not true repentance. That's just a cycle of miserable, miserable, miserable. And the only time that we have a glimpse of respite is when we come into the house of God and hopefully the Spirit of God shows up so profoundly that we can get just an inkling Right? Just get a whiff of what our relationship with God used to be and that's enough to get us just to the next service. Into the next service. That's not living. It's dying on the vine. 
and we're beset. But, well, we can't go backwards because, you know, you're either in or you're out. You cannot have two masters. You love one and hate the other. It's not like you could take a step back. You take a step back from God, you've walked out on God. There's no difference. And we don't want to go forward, so we're beset. Doesn't the Bible say, how long halt you between two opinions? You can have two thoughts in your head. Eventually, you've got to pick one. And eventually, there's that moment in everyone's life where first, you know, God will, through cords of love and kindness, draw us just like He did when He drew us to salvation. Hey, you know, you ought not do that. Then the chastening rod comes. Less enjoyable, but he still does it through love. He corrects what he cares about. But then if we avoid the chastening rod, then we get that thing that's even worse. We don't hear anything from God. And though we know what we ought to do, we continue not to do it. And then like we thought on last week, eventually God's wrath will be poured out. The Bible does say that He turned some over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. I'm not going to say what God will and will not do. I don't want to tempt God. But I do know I deserve a whole lot worse than I've gotten. Even though I've been beset. Not by the world. Not by the devil. You know who besets us? We beset us. The devil can't do to me what God doesn't allow him to. The Bible says that God doesn't tempt us, that in every temptation he makes a way of escape, but he also doesn't let us be tempted above what we're able to bear. If I couldn't resist it, God wouldn't allow it. So what's that tell you? If I'm beset, it's because I wanted to be. Not talking about snares, not talking about things that he throws out there trying to trip us up. The thing that so easily besets us is we knew it was wrong when we did it, but we still wanted to do it, so we did it. Not talking about weights. You can't run if you're beset. Well, what are weights? Well, maybe we care more about what people think than what God thinks. Right? We always need other people's approval before we can do what God wants us to do. That's a weight. You can still move. You could still run if you wanted to, but if you're beset, you can't move. Weights are, for instance, you know, back in biblical days, we'll use this example. Peter had to wait for a long time about eating certain things. And one day God gave him a dream of a fleece. Right? And then later on that day, actually, he goes to a Gentile's house well, back in Bible times, if somebody laid out a spread before you and you didn't eat it, it was offensive to them. They took of their excess and gave to you out of the kindness of their heart as a guest. It showed how highly they thought of you that they would put a spread out. But if you rejected the food, they wouldn't have anything to do with you. Peter had to get over in his head that as long as you give God thanks for it, because God's the one that provided it for you. To God be the glory. Right? He wasn't under the law anymore. And for the gospel's sake, he had to learn that there are some weights that he is carrying around that he had to get rid of. The Bible says that Paul rebuked Peter to the face on the issue of circumcision. That was a weight that Peter had that he had to get rid of. But there are a whole bunch of weights that people have, but that's not doesn't beset you. Throughout all that time, Peter's still being used to God to preach. People getting saved. Church is growing. It slowed him down a little bit, but eventually God dealt with him about it. He got it off and he just kept on running. But if it besets you, you can't do anything. You feel the draw to get closer to God because you truly are sorry most of the time we're sorry about having to pay the price for what we did more than we are about what we did. But we do want to get closer to God, but at the same time we don't because we keep doing what got us in this situation. 
We feel sorry enough to be miserable, but we don't feel sorry enough to get it made right. So, I mean, is today not Resurrection Sunday? I mean, he got up. That meant that sin has no more power over us. He's got the key to death and hell. You know what puts us in the grave? You know what would have sent us to hell? Sin. You know when he has the keys to both of them? You know what that means? Sin can't control us no more. We're no longer part of sin. Well, I mean, when he sees us, he sees us as himself. We're robed in his righteousness. Right? The sin that's so easily beset, it's not even our past sin, because if it's been forgiven, in God's eyes, it never happened. Not even what we did that, you know, it's been forgiven, it doesn't exist no more in God's eyes. If you've confessed all this, and you don't have any sin, unrepentant sin in your life, then when God looks at you, I mean, think of it, we received the adoption of sonship, so if there's nothing that keeps us from, or keeps God from seeing the righteousness that we've been robed in, He sees us as if we've always been a son of God, always been a joint heir with Christ. That means when He sees us, He looks back in the beginning, we was already there with Him. Explain that one. That's what the Bible, He looks at us and He sees Christ. Well, He's always been with Christ, always will be with Christ. Well, in the eyes of God... If we're in His righteousness, we always have been. But see, the sin that does so easily beset us is the one that we choose to take that robe off, hand it back to God and say, I'll be okay on my own. I can handle it. And eventually God will say, okay, you're beset. Not because God said you were beset, because you said you were beset. In fact, truly, don't know why I just thought of this, but the Lord will give, gave it to me, we'll use it. You ever, I remember Christian Sidney, mostly Christian because he's the wildest one. He'd be running around doing something he probably shouldn't have done. You know, he'd fall down and he'd scrape his knee up, right, or he'd scrape an elbow up. And what happens? Blood curdling screams, right? I mean, I'm talking when they're real little. Blood curdling screams. They're screaming for mama, and all they can do is scream. They can't move. They can't think about breathing. Right? They scream until they can't breathe no more. Right? There's something wrong with them. In that moment, they're beset by the fact that they got hurt. They can't move. Can't talk. Can't explain what happened because they're just screaming. Right? Unless somebody was around to see what happened, the parents can't. You know. Mom and dad just here come running up. Oh my gosh, he's dying. No, he's not dying. He just scraped his knee. I watched the whole thing from right over there. But in that moment, that child is beset by fear, by pain, right? By the fact that he's hurt and there's only one person and he knows they can take care of it. In Christian's case, it would have been mama. Mama's boy. But what you say? How often do the things that beset us in God's eyes are so trivial? You just fell down. He's got the ball, McGilead. He can make it okay. But sitting there and screaming and being in pain, so terrified that you can't move, that's beset in that moment. And God looks at us and says, "You don't realize how small of an issue it is." That mom come over, throw some Neosporin and a bandaid on it before you know it. He's climbing up trees or throwing rocks all in the church building or something else he wasn't supposed to do. Okay? Before he knew it, it wasn't even a memory. He's gone. Back at it running. And so often God's saying, if you just get out of the cage, just step outside of the thing that's besetting you. Just come to me and I will give thee rest. But eventually the pain subsides for a little bit. We're able to dust ourselves off again. And then we start looking around and we think, well, it happened last time, but maybe this time if I do it, I won't get hurt again. Well, how many times you got to kick yourself to realize that you probably shouldn't be kicking yourself? 
We can use that analogy, and obviously. Well, yeah, don't do that. Well, how often are, you know, mine's over there in the pew. Every Sunday I get a little pop-up for church. Tells me how many hours or how many minutes I've been using my phone each day to do certain things on it. Right, there's work stuff, emails. Right, there's solitaire because every now and then I get bored. Okay, m- music, podcasts, audible books. Breaks it all down for me. You know what I strive to do? Try to get it lower this week than it was last week. Why? Because the more I'm not on that, the more time I've got to do things for God. If I'm down 9%, which I think is what the number was, if I'm down 9% this week, that means that I might have 9% more of my time to give to God, study, write in prayer, just on meditating on the things of God. Well, if I'm up 1% next week, that's less time I can give to God. We know that we ought to read the Word of God, but if we don't do it, and we're on this instead, that's sin. You may be listening to Christian music, but if you know, you ought to be praying for somebody and you're not. Sin. Not talking about going out and living. I'm just talking about what God said was right and what God said was wrong. We know it's wrong. We know we ought to do different, but we don't. We just stay in the same routine over and over. We're beset. You know what revival is? A chance to get unbeset. To get set back on the solid rock. To get back into the race, because while you're beset, you're not moving. You're begging God to be pruned from the vine. You're begging God to say, Lord, let me pay the price for my own sin. You won't do it for all of eternity, but you can do it now. You're tempting God by saying your way is not the right way. Out of love, He doesn't just wipe us off the face of the earth, although He should. Where would that excuse? Those that know the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ should never have the desire to continue in sin. Yet so often we do. And it's not because the devil made me do it. Nobody can make you do anything except you. Nobody can force your hand except for you. So if I do it, that all boils down to, it's because I wanted to do it. Now thankfully, just because I wanted to do it doesn't mean that he won't forgive me for it. If I truly repent of it, it'll be gone. Revival is to remind me how much my spirit and my soul truly does love God. But whichever side of me I feed is the side that's going to control what actions I do. You may love God, but if you truly loved Him, you'd keep His commandments. It's not that you don't love God, it's that more of you loves the world, sin, doing whatever, than it does love God. You can love people in your family. But let's be honest, there are some that you're obligated to love them because they're a part of the family. But if you had a choice, you wouldn't. And then there's those that you really like to love. Everybody's got a crazy uncle somewhere, right? Everybody's got the one person you can say, can we vote them out of the family? Can we disown them? Right, But in truth... There are some times that we love God, we just love things of the world more. We love not doing what God told us to do more than we love doing it. That's a heart problem. Something has caused a change down here, and that's why we're beset. Rather than pursuing, we're throwing a pity party. We got cages set all around us. And everybody, here's the, th- here's the real thing. Most of the time when we're beset, it'd be, it'd be like, okay, champ, 
pretty smart dog. Not the smartest dog in the world, but a pretty smart dog. Mom bought him those, well, didn't buy him, had him left over from Christian Sydney. Those baby cages, you put it like the top and the bottom of the steps to keep the kids from running up and down. Well, she tried to keep them in the kitchen. But we only had two gates, so she put like boxes and chairs and everything else in the way. He found a way through it. I always find a way to get around the gate. Why? Because he hated being in the kitchen. Right? She tried to beset him, but it didn't work. And nowadays he's got full reign of the house. Well, there are other times that you could just put a gate up in front of a dog. Or actually, I've seen you got two sets of doors on the same wall. Both of them go outside. You got dogs standing at the closed door barking to get in, the other door's wide open. That that dog was not beset, but it thought that it was. Truly, sin has no control over you. You either choose to do it or you don't. But there are some times that we think, well, I just I I can't do anything. And then people are walking by you saying, You've got you've got half a cage around you. It's not even all the way around you. You could get up and get out if you wanted to, but they've convinced themselves, I've got to stay here. It's real easy to beset you if all you gotta do is put up half a gate. If all you've got to do is close the blinds on the window for you to think that there's no outside anymore. That there's nothing better. And you know where all this battle takes place? Right here and right here. Some people can't see the forest for the trees. Other people are so busy looking at the forest that they have missed the tree that they just walked into. But either way, why do you think? Verse number two, looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for who the joy that was set before him endured the cross, crossed it, overcome him, despised the shame of the sin that was laid upon him, but yet he still embraced it because he bore our sin to pay our sin debt. This is, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The one that we put all of our faith and trust in, sin had no power over him. So if we put our trust in him, sin has no power over us. We're without excuse. We are beset because we choose to be beset. Then verse number 3, For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. God's equipped you with everything you need to run. The only thing you've got to get straightened out is right here. You can run, but will you? Not until you want to. There's going to be days that you don't want to run the race. There's going to be days that you don't want to roll up and get up out of bed. But on those days, like Jeremiah said, I wanted to quit, but there's, there's a fire shut up in my bones. If more of you wants to run and more of you doesn't want to run, you'll get up and run. But the day that you think, well, I just need to take today off, that day will turn into a week and then a month and then a year. And it's not because your get up and go is still in a part of you. It's that the part of you that wants to stay and be miserable has gotten stronger than the get up and go. Run the race with patience, understanding that there's going to be pitfalls. There's going to be times that I sprain my ankle. There's going to be times that I get scraped up. There's going to be times that I fall in mud puddles. But each time I know I can get up out of it, He can clean me off, and I can keep on running. Patience understands there's going to be problems. But patience also understands I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Patience also understands that there's a friend that sticketh closer to the brother that he'll never leave me nor forsake me that every step of the way one, he's already walked it because he paved it but then he chooses again to walk it with me as I follow in his footsteps you ever think about that? he said follow me but then he also said that he'd be with you we're following his footsteps and he's walking right next to us don't think about that too hard or you'll start walking in circles trying to follow both sets of footprints All of it has to do with what we desire. The prayer should not be, Lord, give me the power not to do it. You already have that power. 
Lord, give me the will not to do it. Well, the party already knows you shouldn't do it. You've got that part. Lord, change my heart. As the psalmist said, Lord, seek me out. Reveal to me what I need to repent of so that I can get whatever's besetting me out of my way. And it all starts with one step. If you get up over that gate, you'll be fine. Because he's drawn out of you. All he's waiting for you to do is say, Lord, help me, and he'll be there. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.